What's up everybody? This is Aaron from Aaron's Audio Corner and today I'm going to be reviewing the JBL 708P Professional by Amplified Active Studio Monitor. It's two-way. What I will say right up front is this speaker impressed the heck out of me. So of late I've had a run of testing speakers that I'm not happy with and that does include some of JBL's other speakers. The HDI 3800, the HDI 4500, both of those were you know, good speakers in their own right, but to me, they just didn't really live up to the expectation that I had for them. And then the JBL, is it the LSR 305 PMK2, which is $150 budget monitor speaker with a five inch mid woofer and then the Waveguide dome tweeter inside of it, which a lot of people really enjoy, but it seems like the issues that I had with that particular speaker are attributed to QC problems. Uh, the front baffle tended to resonate and it really just ruined my enjoyment of that speaker. So when I got the opportunity to you know, test and listen to this speaker, which I finally did fully about a week ago, I was really, truly impressed. The output on this speaker, now keep in mind, this is a near field, mid field speaker. So it's not intended to be listened to, you know, at far field distances necessarily. It's not like it's a home theater type speaker. It is intended namely, you know, at least marketing wise for mastering and mixing music as well as movies because it does have a frame sync so you can kind of sync up dialogue you know on the screen with the speakers in, in that regard but that's that's a feature that i won't really get into because that's kind of outside of what i'm talking about in this review but having said that the thing that i really liked about the speaker was just the consistency of response linearity meaning that the on-axis response was mostly flat. It was pretty much within plus or minus one and a half dB from about, um, I think 50 Hertz to, you know, the, the high frequency region and it's F3, which is the three decibel down point from its mean SPL was just over 40 Hertz, which means that it has no problem digging into the upper, or I guess I should say the lower mid bass region. This is something that I rarely say about speakers and I'll say it about this speaker. Unless you're mixing music with a lot of content below 40 hertz, maybe even as low as 30 hertz, you may not need a subwoofer with these speakers, especially if you're listening at you know moderate volumes and you're in the midfield, so maybe two to three meters away, uh, even more so if you're listening in the near field, you know, just a meter or so away. If you put these up next to a wall, which you can do, you'll get some boundary reinforcement, so that would kind of help give you a little bit more low end. And you can do that with this speaker because it has the front firing slot port, it doesn't have a rear port like some speakers do, which would keep you otherwise from being able to put the speaker near a wall. Additionally, when you put a speaker near a wall, you have issues with boundary reinforcement, you know, so it helps you get a little bit more bass, but then it also kind of mucks up your mid range. But this speaker has a slew of EQ bands, so you can actually tailor the, the speaker's response to the room and you can separately adjust the speaker's response itself. So if that sounds confusing, let me explain. The speaker has two sets of uh, EQ, not bands, but you know, EQ options. First set would be the actual speaker EQ. And I think it's eight bands of EQ for the speaker itself, like anechoic, not counting for the room itself, but just the actual speaker. So if there's something about the sound of the speaker itself, not the room, but the speaker, then you can adjust the speaker's uh, response itself. Then once you put the speaker into the room, you have, I think maybe eight or 12, I don't, I don't know the numbers, but you, know, you can look that up later if you want, but you have additional bands of equalization that you can actually make sure that you help take out the room effect. So, you know, putting near a wall, you can kind of EQ up the mid range when it kind of gets that suck out in that region. Or if there's, you know, a modal issue from the room geometry itself, you can take care of that. And the speaker has all sorts of those EQ options. We'll walk through a couple of them shortly. But for now, what I'm going to say before I kick things off and go a little bit further is that I really and truly love the sound of these speakers. I was listening to all of my favorite tracks sitting anywhere from two to three meters away and man, it just blew me away. Now I will note that I only had the one speaker, so I was not able to listen to these in a stereo pair. And that's because the owner just sent me the one. He bought it used and, and it's fine, but you know, he could only send me the one speaker, didn't have the other speakers send me as a pair. But with that said, you know, I, I listened in mono and just summed everything down to mono and listened 
for the tonality and I was just floored. And I can't really speak on the actual, you know, how it integrates with the room and different sizes because I didn't have the stereo pair. But just keep that in mind. Uh, the data also tells us, you know, that the speaker has a pretty good radiation pattern. We'll talk about that shortly too. But for now, I'm gonna flip this thing around and you can just check out the back. So on the back, we have a few different inputs and I'm gonna to have to step around here to look and remind myself. We've got a uh, digital input and then we've got a digital through, AES standard digital input. Then you've got an analog XLR input back here as well. And we've also got some settings, so I'm gonna zoom in and show you what those settings are. Here we have the back of the 708P. I'm gonna power it on. And you can see it's got an LCD screen on the back that allows you to make adjustments. And we'll walk through a couple of those adjustments in real time. Now, the first thing that pops up is the input trim, which you can set to, I don't even know how far down it goes, but pretty far down. So we're going to say, OK, uh, we're going to go into the menu, input selection, analog, AES digital, different stuff going on here, input sensitivity plus 4 dBU or minus 10 dBV. I'll leave it there. Uh, speaker trim, AES level trim, user EQ. Now this is one of the features that is really nice to have. Outside of room EQ, you can also set user EQ. And go give you an example of what you can kind of do here. Right now, the frequency is set to 1.81 kilohertz. This is just one example. And you can see as you, you know, move this knob around, you've got a very fine level of adjustments. I don't know exactly what this is, but this is probably you know, maybe 1 12th uh, dB per octave, or I should say 1 12 octave steps in here. Um, but then the next step would be, let's say you selected the frequency and you're gonna move on to the next thing, would be your gain. And you can go, let's see how far down you can go. Goodness. Keep going, minus 12 dB, and you can go up to plus 12 dB. So you've got a lot of adjustment availability here as far as attenuation or boosting goes. And let's see what the Q, so I played around with this earlier. This is the maximum Q is 16. That's very, very, very narrow for a Q filter. So if you have a very specific peak or dip that you want to try to adjust and generally I would just adjust peaks I would knock them down so you can target a specific very steep peak if you want to do that or you can go very broad Q now for what it's worth just for reference standard graphic EQ bands is uh, somewhere around four Q is setting of four I can't remember if it's 4.3 or if it's exactly four but it's somewhere in that ballpark and the lower you go the uh, more frequencies you're able to adjust, meaning that if you have an EQ band or a Q set of 0.1 and you have your target frequency at one kilohertz, as you're making attenuation to that, you would not only be affecting one kilohertz, you could be affecting down as far as maybe 500 hertz or 1500 hertz. You can go, basically, uh, it's very broad. And then if you wanted to go more narrow toward like a you know one third octave EQ somewhere around four that would really just target you know one kilohertz to maybe about 800 hertz up to about 1.2 kilohertz and that, that's kind of just a, a generalization there but it gives you an idea that the steeper this number is the higher this number is the steeper the uh, filter will allow you to adjust so let's go back into this and try to work my way to get out of here and back there we go there we go i'm so smart all right and you've got let's see how many available bands showing me four parametric eq bands that you can adjust then you've got the option for high shelf and low shelf so if you just wanted to knock down high frequencies at a certain point you could do that you've got the option to target a slope of 3 db per octave as much as 15 db per octave and that is pretty great thing to have. So basically if you know your high frequencies are just a bit too too much for you overall, you can knock down the high frequency from two kilohertz upward by just a couple dB or a portion of a dB or something like that. And then you get into your room EQ and you can go and set that. You could tailor the the speaker to the room with the room EQ and then if you wanted to play around with the individual sound of the speaker itself, 
than when you would use the user EQ. At least that's how I would use it and how I think it's probably intended to be used. Then you've got speaker delay, you've got frame delay to match this up with video, uh, some base management settings, and a lot of this stuff I really just frankly did not get into. But I just really wanted to focus on the equalization. So we're gonna end this here and move on. Now that we've kind of done the intro, let's go and look at the data that I captured using Clipple's Near Fill Scanner. And we'll talk about the objective data and you won't have to rely on my subjective opinions quite as much. So all this data can be found on my website, which is Aaron's Audio Corner and I will put it in the description below. When I measure speakers, I do so using the Clipple Near Field Scanner, which is a state-of-the-art device that allows you to get anechoic data in a non-anechoic environment, such as my garage. I'll drop a video here of the device in action on a previous test, and what you can see is it is a robotic machine. It scans the speaker 360 degrees and creates a sound field profile of the speaker that, again, is better than anechoic data. It's actually more accurate because it doesn't have any of the low frequency issues like room modes that anechoic chambers often do. I have also conducted an interview with one of the designers, Christian Bellman of Clipple. And if you wanna see that, it's a really great, you know, at least in my opinion, if you wanna nerd out, it's a great little interview and discussion with Christian about, you know, how the near field scanner came to be and some of the science behind it. So if you wanna check that out, just click the little play button on my website and go watch that. Now, all of my measurements are done per the CTA 2034 standard. And if you wanna read more about that standard, you can click this link. I've created a series of videos and a playlist, which I'll drop up here. And that describes what all of these measurements that I'm about to go through means in a lot more detail, providing you with examples. So we don't have to spend gears on that particular thing. In this video, I can just kind of touch on the highlights. And with that said, let's go ahead and look at the response. So the on-axis response of the 708P in black, as you can see, is really quite linear. And I'm gonna go ahead and skip down here to give you a better idea of what the on-axis linearity is. This is a graphic that I created. And the gray bars, well, first of all, the black line represents the on-axis response of the speaker. The gray bar represents the one and a half dB window. And then the blue bar represents the plus minus 3 dB window of the speaker's response. So I take the average of the SPL from 300 Hertz to three kilohertz, and then I just bound it. And I tell you, hey, this is what the response linearity is. And you can see that for the most part, the speaker is within plus or minus one and a half dB, which is really quite good, except for it's got some notable issues in the upper to mid mid range. Well, I guess more like mid mid range in the 600 Hertz to one kilohertz region. I'm not exactly sure what these are, if they are port resonances or if they are standing waves or if there's some kind of diffraction issue potentially from the uh, midwoofer being sunken back into the baffle itself. Uh, but regardless, what we see is an indication of some sort of resonance in this data. And the way that we can tell that is if we go back and look at the spinorama data and you can see that that trend, these peaks here and the six, 700 Hertz region, as well as the 900 Hertz region are also found in the off axis response. So these uh, blue and red lines. And yeah, that just indicates a resonance of some sort. Now, to be honest with you, I didn't really have an issue with that in the music that I listened to. Maybe it's just because I didn't have music that you know highlighted those areas like I do other areas a lot of times. Or maybe it's just I wasn't adept to hearing that. I can't really tell you. I can just tell you that honestly, it wasn't anything that I found offensive. And the other thing too is that these are relatively high Q peaks in a short order. So they're about plus, what, maybe like one, maybe one and a half dB in order. So they're really not that high. Uh, if they were plus five dB or maybe even plus three dB, I would be more likely to hear that. Not saying I would hear it, but I would be more likely to hear that. So that's really all I can tell you about that. I will also say that, yes, for $1,800 a speaker, you would not necessarily want this. Uh, it would not be ideal. But again, it's not anything that I heard that I found offensive. Uh, I think in terms of what I heard, the only issue really that I had was just, I felt like the top end was just a little bit too much overall. And I would knock that down maybe like a half a dB if I could, which as I said, you've got all sorts of EQ adjustments on the speaker and you can make those adjustments. You can even knock these notches down and then you can bring up this mid range. And we're talking about, you know, nitpicking a speaker that really otherwise is quite good. If you go and look 
Uh, it doesn't start rolling off until it's down to about 50 hertz and it's f3 point is somewhere in the 40 hertz region it's a really good speaker overall uh, one that i enjoyed listening to a lot and then if we go down here and look at the directivity we do see there's some sort of mismatch going on around 1250 uh, because the speaker is starting or the midwoofer presumably is starting to beam as it's increasing in directivity and then it becomes omnidirectional right around here the directivity does and usually that indicates a crossover region. So I'm going to guess that the crossover region is somewhere in this ballpark. Uh, I don't know. And I could look that up, but sometimes where's the fun in that? You can just look at the data and try to figure it out. And I think that's interesting. Going beyond that, however, if we look at the upper frequency, so the two kilohertz plus, this blue line, even the red sound power line, they're almost flat. And what that indicates is a very wide dispersion that is the same on axis as well as it is off axis. And that's a really good thing because that means whatever reflections you have coming at the side walls is gonna be uh, the same sound, so to speak, in regards to what you have coming at you on axis. So these are all good things, right? And moving on to the next set of data, uh, the early reflections, you can look at that on your own time. The estimated in-room response. Now this will be assumed for two meters distance and far field here. Uh, what would happen if you're listening closer to the speaker would be that this line right here would probably be a little bit more peaked up, have a little bit more treble to it than it already does. And I actually think that, you know, this is the area where I was hearing that I said I'd probably knock down like half a dB, bring it down here a little bit, personally speaking, because I felt like it was maybe just I don't want to use the word bright, but it was just a little bit too much on the upper frequency end of the spectrum. And then again, we see these areas of concern, the resonances that you could probably go in and EQ out. And then you might even just want to EQ up the mid range uh, just a little bit around this 500 Hertz region. That's my recommendation kind of just based on what I'm seeing here and a little bit of what I heard as well. Now, if we go and look at the SPL horizontal, so the off-axis response, we can see that the off-axis trends very, very well to the on-axis. Uh, you do have a couple areas that are intriguing, but I don't necessarily know that they're of major concern when you get to 70 degrees or more off-axis. But beyond that, you know, everything here looks really good as far as mimicking on-axis with off-axis response. And then vertical response, we can see that vertical response-wise, where you want to be, where your ears should be, is at the reference line, which is the tweeter axis. So that's where I actually measure the speaker, and that's where you should be listening to the speaker. Uh, if you try to go above or below that, you're going to get some kind of dip in response, and you would have to kind of follow these lines to understand. But if you go 10 degrees above the speaker, you've got a notch right through here. And then if you go 10 degrees below the speaker, you've got a steeper notch uh, between 2 to 3 kilohertz. So ideally, you want to be on axis with the tweeter line. Glow plots. This is just another way of looking at the SPL horizontal. And on this graphic, if we start at 200 hertz, what we saw is same thing as before. You're at about plus or minus 90 degrees in radiation uh, until you get to about, what is that, three, four, 400 to 500 hertz somewhere. Then you narrow up and then you go wide again to about 800 hertz. And then when you get above two kilohertz, you're more narrow. And then the dispersion of the tweeter starts to increase. So it gets wider horizontally. Um, this is something that, you know, kind of struck me as a little bit odd and I didn't really hear this radiation pattern drifting as much as this data is showing, but I also did my listening in mono, unfortunately, and I was also near field, which is going to have less room interaction. I mean, I was dead center of my room and I was trying to treat this more as how would you use it if you bought this and you were mixing and mastering with these speakers, you would probably be close to them. You wouldn't be five or six meters away or four meters away, you know, on a couch in a home theater type setting, you wouldn't be doing that. So trying to mimic that setting, you know, I didn't really notice any of these issues. I do find I'm curious. So if you own these speakers and you listen to them, you know, maybe in a smaller room, you might find there is some distinction between the on-axis sound and the off-axis sound at about 1.3 uh, kilohertz, give or take, based on what I'm seeing here. And I would be curious to know what you think. So please leave me a comment below if you have some thoughts on this. You know, if you've heard them and, and you own these speakers, I would really be curious what other people have heard. Uh, the vertical plot, you know, I'm going to kind of skip this because it's the same thing again we've we'll, we'll already seen with the vertical. The harmonic distortion and compression is really where the speaker shines. Harmonic distortion at 86 dB, well below 1%, even down to 40 hertz 
oh my goodness. Uh, at 96 dB, you're riding 1%. Uh, you're below 3%, below 100 hertz. This is really good distortion numbers. And I'm not saying that this necessarily means that it's going to sound great uh, because there's so much low distortion because we're still not there yet as far as audibility of distortion you know, metrics. Uh, hopefully, maybe one day we'll, we'll get a better understanding of this. But I generally look at this to see if there's any issues with the speaker ringing or you know, you're pushing a driver too hard. And I'm not seeing really any of those issues. And the only thing that kind of stands out to me in this data is this rise right here in the tweeter area. And I don't really think that anybody's going to hear it. It's second order. And I think really that this is just the tweeters uh, crossover region. So I just kind of find that interesting that you can see that peaking up here. Uh, but I don't expect that anybody's really going to hear it. Now for the dynamic range. And I'll reference you again back to the a playlist of videos where I discuss what this data means because I don't really have the time to get into it here anymore. Please see that video set and I'll put it up here again. The linearity from 76 dB all the way out to 100 dB on the speaker is really, really good. You're within about a quarter of a dB uh, compression enhancement, which is really good. That means that as you turn the speaker up, the profile, the sound of the speaker is not changing. And then for the long-term testing, this is what I would consider the de facto standard, what every speaker should achieve to be at 86 dB, this speaker's output does not change at all. I mean, it is ruler flat. It hasn't changed. So that means that as you listen to the speaker longer, it's not changing the response. Lesser speakers change in response over time. And so you talk about ear fatigue. Well, not only is there a such thing as ear fatigue, there's speaker fatigue because the speaker is just like, dude, I can't do this anymore. I'm giving up. I'm going to start cutting two kilohertz and you're going to lose some other frequencies too. It happens. All my other data shows it. So to date, this is the best speaker I've seen uh, with that. And now we're going to look at 96 dB and it's a little bit different, but keep in mind the scale here, the compression and the enhancement differences are like maybe even less than a 10th of a dB, incredibly, incredibly low. This is the bar that all speakers should try to achieve. A couple notes about what I heard. You know, you can go and read my website, but I'm just going to mention a couple of these things. Lauren Hill's doo -wop, uh, That's That track has a lot of bass content. And if you have a speaker that tends to uh, compress or distort, this track will do it to it. And I didn't have any issues at all listening to this track. It, uh, frankly, I was a bit amazed. There was no issues whatsoever with buzzing, rattling from the speaker. Uh, the speaker was not, you know, overexerting itself. So the, the bass driver was not uh, popping or, or making any kind of mechanical noises like I'm used to hearing from lesser speakers. Another thing that I really liked about these speakers was Nor Jones, Tell Your Mama. That, th that track has a lot of bass resonance typically, you know, within the track itself, and it will light up problems in cabinet designs. I mean, if I can play that track and if it's got an enclosure resonance, this track's going to tell me right away. There was none of that in this, in this speaker test at all. Like, I mean, when I was listening to this track, there was nothing in, in that regards, but that does it for my objective review. You can find all this information on the website. And now we're going to kick this out and try to wrap this thing up. That's going to be it for this review. I hope you appreciate it. And I hope you learned something about this speaker. If you were considering buying it, you know, and it's in your budget, I would have no qualms with recommending it. I would advise that you take my data and Go to the EQ section for the speakers themselves. And my personal taste would lend me to take a very wide Q filter, put it at about six kilohertz and knock that down just half a dB. Just take a little bit of the top end off. But man, you're really talking about picking nits at that point. Overall, this is a superb speaker in my personal opinion. The data shows a really good story. And as far as output goes, it's got output for days. It's not a home theater speaker. But if you're talking about, you know, near field to midfield listening, so one to three meters and maybe even beyond that, this speaker suffers no compression, uh, extremely, extremely low distortion with a lot of output potential, a lot of dynamic range. So in my opinion, this is a great speaker and I would truly recommend it if you're considering it. And with that said, here comes the cheap plug. If you do consider buying this speaker, uh, also consider using one of my affiliate links, which I'll throw in the description below. That helps me out. You can go through B&H photo video, or you can go through Amazon if you want. Uh, it gives me like a two to 4% commission, depending on which one you do, which helps me keep doing what I'm doing here with this channel and buying all this stuff to test speakers out and 
you know, all the gear to make the videos that I do. So I would appreciate that. And if you don't want to do affiliate link, just Google it and do what you normally would do otherwise. That's my spiel. And with that, I'm out. I'll talk to y'all later. Take care. Peace.